Clyde Decker stretched his arms over his head, arching his back against the worn pilot's chair. He'd been cooped up too long in the cramped cockpit of the Toyota Star Runner. But the hypnotic thrum of the aging ship's engines soothed him like an old friend's familiar voice. Just a few more trade runs, and we can take that long overdue break on Sildra V. Bonnie, he called out over the intercom to his wife. You've been saying that for years, flyboy, came Bonnie's sardonic reply. I'll believe this mythical vacation when I'm sipping a tidal breeze on those pristine silver beaches. Clyde chuckled. Her razor wit was one of the things he loved most about that woman. He was about to dish out another playful jab when a new sensor contact flashed across his display. Ah hell, looks like we've got company. He squinted at the image resolving on the view screen. Zaranith patrol ship by the looks of it. Those scaly bureaucrats just can't leave an honest traitor be. No sooner had the words left his mouth than the Star Runner's calm panel crackled to life. Unidentified human vessel, power down your drive and prepare to be boarded. You are in violation of collective regulations. Clyde's brow furrowed. Now just hold on a dang minute. The name's Clyde Decker, captain and owner of this here craft the Toyota Star Runner. Hauling a completely legitimate cargo run here. No need for all the heavy hand tactics. The alien voice responded, devoid of inflection. The profile of your vessel does not match registered human commercial transports. You are hereby ordered to comply or defensive measures will be initiated. What cosmic garbage pile did they just crawl out of? Bonnie's irritated voice cut across the calm. Hey, slugheads, you might want to update those junkie scanners of yours. Our ship may look like a museum piece, but she's state-of-the-art where it counts. The tinny alien voice remained implacable. Human vessel, our scans detect significant modifications to your hull and drive signatures, indicating possible military augmentation. Surrender immediately, or you will be fired upon. Clyde pinched the bridge of his nose, thinking quickly. Things were escalating faster than a cut-rate hyperdrive motivator. Listen, buddy, I think we got ourselves a simple misunderstanding here. No need to start shooting proton charges at each other. Why don't you take a closer look at my ship's configuration files before you trigger tentacles start calling me an enemy combatant? Negative human. You have 60 cycles to comply before terminal force is authorized. Bonnie's voice cut back in, laced with venom. Over my dead body, you xenophobic slime devils. Clyde, launch countermeasures. I'll warm up the ion cannons. Cool your thrusters, darlin', Clyde replied in a placating tone. No need to start an interstellar incident quite yet. Just let me try a more diplomatic approach first. A few taps on the control panel transmitted the Star Runner's complete registry details, including the official Humanx Customs certifications. Clyde held his breath as the data packet was received by the Zaranith ship. There was a tense pause. Then the flat alien voice responded, somehow sounding even more robotic than before. Data transfer received. However, ship profile still registers as potential military class. You will be taken into custody aboard our vessel for further questioning. Clyde clenched his jaw. These legion of bureaucratic squids were truly determined to ruin his day over some misaligned probability matrix. He tried once more to reason with the obstinate patroller. Now look here, I've been an independent trader for 20 cycles, Chris crossing the quadrant more times than a nav comp has digits. My ship may look a little unconventional, but I assure you, everything aboard is completely on the level. No military tech, no shady business. Just an honest hauler trying to make an honest living. There was an interminable silence. Then, negative human. You will surrender your vessel to our custody immediately, or we will be forced to disable your craft and take you by terminal force. A series of ominous tones signaled the ship's weapon systems powering up. Clyde sighed heavily, raking his fingers through his graying hair. He opened a private channel to Bonnie. Well, so much for diplomacy. Best get those ion turbos warmed up, sweetheart. These xenomorph bouncers clearly have no sense of humor. Or common sense, for that matter. Might be time to do things the old-fashioned human way. He could practically hear Bonnie's savage grin through the calm. My favorite kind of way. Clyde cracked his knuckles and took the Star Runner's control yoke in a white-knuckled grip. He doubted the Zaraneth patrol had any inkling of the surprises he'd installed in his little museum piece. 
It was going to be one hell of a day at the office. The star runner's drives flared to life as Clyde executed evasive maneuvers, Bonnie's fingers dancing across the weapon's controls. But despite their best efforts, the Zeranith patrol craft's superior firepower scored multiple hits, disabling the aging freighter's shields and drive systems. Damn it! Clyde slammed his fist against the dead control panel as the star runner's lights flickered and died. Looks like we're going for a ride, sweetheart. Within minutes, the freighter's outer hatches screeched open as armed Zeranith boarders in environmental suits swarmed aboard. Clyde raised his hands in surrender as the barrel of an energy rifle was leveled at his head. All right, you ugly crustacean bastards, no need to get all violent, he growled. Me and my girl will come along peacefully. The lead Zeranith guard gave a curt nod, his beady black eyes unreadable behind the armored faceplate. With a series of grunts and clicks in their guttural language, Clyde and Bonnie were bound and shuffled into the patrol craft's detention hold. Clyde tried to get the attention of the impassive guards, but they ignored his shouts, simply locking him and Bonnie into separate cramped cells. With a frustrated sigh, he settled onto the bare bench, resting his throbbing head in his hands as the patrol ship's engines rumbled to life beneath them. Hours ticked by in silence until the muffled sounds of more scuffling and bellowed orders reached Clyde's ears. His cell door slid open with a hiss, and he was hauled out by two brutish guards, their bony carapaces glinting dimly in the low light. Where are you taking us, you overgrown sea monkeys? Clyde demanded, struggling against their grip. The guards didn't respond, simply shoving him into what looked like an interrogation chamber. Bonnie was already seated, looking furious with her hands bound behind her back. An armored Zeranith interrogator loomed over her, its reedy voice grating in Clyde's ears. You will submit to questioning regarding the nature of your illegal activities against the collective human female. Like hell I will, you glorified bug, Bonnie spat. And take these binders off me right now before I rip off one of those freaky stalks growing out of your head. The interrogator reared back, its beady eyes widening in what Clyde assumed was surprise or anger. It raised a spindly appendage clearly about to issue disciplinary measures against Bonnie's defiance. I wouldn't do that if I were you, chum, Clyde interjected quickly, putting on his most charming negotiator's smile. We humans tend to be a bit touchy about our womenfolk being roughed up. Why don't you tell me what this is all about, and we can get everything sorted without anyone losing an appendage they might miss? The interrogator fixed its cold gaze on Clyde, seeming to consider his words. After an intense moment, it gestured to the guards who swiftly unlocked Bonnie's restraints, though keeping their weapons trained on the fuming woman. Very well, human male. You will explain the severe violations of collective military regulations that our scans have detected regarding your vessels. Unconventional specifications. Clyde allowed himself a tight grin, sensing an opportunity to talk their way out of this mess, for now at least. He settled into the hard chair, folding his hands on the featureless table as the bright interrogation lamp bored into his eyes. Well now, way I hear it, your hardware is getting its decimals crossed on exactly what kind of rig all Clyde has been flying. So why don't I lay it all out nice and clear before this gets any more uglier than it needs to be? The interrogator gave a curt nod, fixing Clyde with its piercing obsidian stare. Clyde launched into his well-rehearsed spiel about the legitimate reasons behind all the unique modifications he'd made to the aging star runner over the decades. Granted, a few creative omissions were required regarding some of the more exotic defense systems he'd jury-rigged. But for the most part, he stuck to the unvarnished truth about its completely civilian nature and purpose. As the hours dragged on, Bonnie appeared to grow more impatient with his rambling ship tech babble though the interrogator showed no outward reaction. Clyde simply powered through, throwing in a few embellished asides about human cultural traditions to keep their xenoform hosts off balance. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the interrogator held up a thin appendage, silencing Clyde mid-sentence with a stern click. Your statement has been recorded, though much of it remains. Confounding to our protocols. You will be detained aboard this processing station while the verification of your claims proceeds. Clyde opened his mouth to protest, but the flinty look in the alien's soulless eyes gave him pause. He'd pressed their captors about as far as was prudent for now. With a reluctant nod, he allowed the guards to march him and Bonnie from the chamber, their immediate future carefully clouded in doubt and bureaucracy.
The processing station's stark corridors seemed to stretch on forever as Clyde was marched between the implacable Zaranith guards. He stole a glance at Bonnie, her jaw set in a tight line as she matched his stride. They'd been in plenty of scrapes before, but this unnecessary detainment was quickly becoming one of their biggest headaches yet. Finally, they reached a heavy portal, which hissed open with a gust of recycled air. Clyde blinked in the harsh light of the interrogation chamber as he was shoved into a rigid metal chair. Across the bare table, a lone Zaranith sat impassively, its mottled green carapace bristling with decorative ridges and nodes denoting some high rank. So, Clyde began with a tight smile, I take it you're the big brain case I'll need to convince of my innocence? The alien gave no reaction, its obsidian eyes studying Clyde intently for a long moment before speaking in a reedy, distorted tone. You are Clyde Decker, human captain of the illegally modified craft interdicted by our patrol, correct? Clyde started to respond, but the interrogator held up a spindly appendage for silence. You are hereby charged with multiple flagrant violations of collective military engagement statutes, up to and including attempted armed confrontation and willful disregard for authority. It fixed Clyde with its soulless stare. If found guilty, the penalties could be severe. Immediately and completely, you will provide details of your activities. Clapping his hands together, Clyde plastered on his most innocent expression. Well now, I'm just a simple hauler making my way across the stars same as any other work-a-day Joe. No idea what in the cosmos gave your webbed goons the notion I was up to no good with my lil prize gem of a ship. The interrogator's eyes narrowed to slits as it jabbed a pointed appendage toward a holoscreen, where grainy images of the Star Runner's interdiction played out. You directly contravend multiple commands to surrender your vessel when identified as an illegal military craft. Its voice took on a raspier edge. Then you escalated with hostile countermeasures when boarding was initiated. Whoa, whoa, hold up there, Pascal, Clyde raised his hands defensively. Way I recall it, your buddies started shooting first before I got a chance to straighten out the misunderstanding about my ships. Unique upgrades. An honest working stiff's gotta be able to defend his payload, am I right? The interrogator didn't so much as twitch at Clyde's cajoling tone. Your extensive illegal modifications are clear evidence of covert human armament and subterfuge within collective space. Specious claims of self-defense do not absolve. Now hang on just a galactic minute. Bonnie's irritated voice cut across the interrogator's droning accusations. Those so-called modifications are just good all frontier ingenuity that my Clyde used to keep our junker in the stars all these years. We ain't dabbling in any military stupidity, we're simple traitors is all. Seeming to notice her for the first time, the interrogator swiveled its armored head toward Bonnie, eyes narrowing further. You will remain silent, female human, unless you are directly engaged for questioning. Anything you utter can and will be held against. She's got just as much right to be heard as me, buddy, Clyde cut in sharply. Way I was raised, a married couple deals with officious meatbags like you as a teen. You got a problem with hearing both sides of our story? The interrogator fell silent for a long moment, its insectoid face somehow managing to convey clueless bewilderment. I do not process your meaning, human. What context is your married couple relationship germane to these proceedings? Clyde couldn't resist a grin, sensing an opportunity to sow some productive chaos. He launched into an exaggerated, rambling explanation of human matrimonial unions, utterly obfuscating the bizarre alien concept with a dizzying blend of literal and figurative interpretations from his homeworld's cultures. Well, you see, two people joining together in the sacred union of marriage has a quite profound and, some would say, mystical significance for our kind. He carried on for several minutes, describing nonsensical rituals and made-up folklore surrounding wedded partnerships. From the corner of his eye, he caught Bonnie's look of pure, barely contained exasperation. But the interrogator seemed to be hanging on his every word, its eye stalks twitching rapidly in apparent confusion and growing frustration. Finally, the alien held up an appendage, silencing Clyde's ridiculous rambling. Enough of your asinine prattling human. Your attempt at diversion through sheer inanity is ineffective. We will resume discussing the explicit facts of your captured vessel. Forthwith. Clyde gave an exaggerated shrug, keeping his features pulled into an expression of genuine innocence. Hey now, you asked about the intricacies of human marriage traditions. I was just doing my humble best to oblige. 
though I got to admit, for such an esteemed inquisitor, you seemed awfully flustered by a little personal chit-chat. The alien's mottled carapace seemed to darken slightly as it narrowed its eyes to obsidian slits. I grow weary of your interminable prevarications, human, it hissed, looming closer. By the hour, your obstinance increases the severity of your ultimate sentence. Produce honest facts regarding your vessel's purpose, or our accommodation will cease immediately. A tense silence stretched between them. Clyde wet his lips, realizing he may have pushed his captor's patience to the limit for the time being. Still, he would be damned if he simply rolled over to these belligerent asshats without seeing just how far he could bend before they snapped. He glanced at Bonnie, giving her a subtle wink before turning back to the fuming interrogator with an implacable look. Well, how about we start again then with my full statement about the legitimate purposes and legal certifications for each and every modification? I'm sure if you just lend me your utmost comprehension, we'll get through this annoying setback soon enough. The interrogator's featureless expression was unreadable, but Clyde could almost taste its growing frustration. Round two was shaping up to be a real barn burner of interstellar diplomacy. Clyde took a breath, mentally preparing himself to launch into yet another long-winded diatribe about the Star Runner's misunderstood quirks and modifications. But before he could begin, the interrogation room's door slid open with a hiss. A human man in an immaculate uniform strode purposefully inside, straight-backed and exuding an aura of composed authority. Clyde felt his spirits lift slightly as he recognized the insignia, this must be one of the diplomatic contingents stationed on the outpost. The Zaranith interrogator shifted in its seat, mandibles clicking in what Clyde could only assume was annoyance at the interruption. You are not permitted within these proceedings, human ambassador, it said in clipped tones. This is an internal matter off-checked security regarding a a misunderstanding that has frankly gone on quite long enough, Inquisitor, the man replied evenly, removing his cap to reveal close-cropped gray hair. I am Ambassador David McCarthy, appointed negotiator for this sector. I've been briefed on the complexities surrounding Mr. Decker and his vessel. He turned to Clyde with a thin smile, giving a subtle wink only the traitor caught. I must admit, Despite the precarious situation, I'm rather looking forward to unraveling this little mystery with you in person, sir. Clyde felt himself reflexively grinning back as he caught the man's meaning loud and clear McCarthy was running interference, likely sensing an opportunity to cut through the alien red tape clouding the issue. Well now, I'd say a little fresh perspective is just what the doctor ordered, Ambassador, he replied, leaning back in his chair with an air of nonchalance. These green-jawed Jobsworths were starting to make my head spin with their pig-headed insistence that my humble freighter is some kind of star-blasting man o' war. McCarthy nodded solemnly, though the corners of his mouth twitched ever so slightly. He turned back to the interrogator, who was watching the exchange with apparent bemusement. As the appointed human liaison for this outpost, I believe I can mediate an amenable solution that is satisfactory to all parties. The alien seemed to consider this for a moment face unreadable. Very well, Ambassador, it said at last. You may participate and submit testimony or evidence germane to these proceedings. But any diversion or obfuscation on your part will be logged as willful obstruction, with maximum punitive counteractions enacted. It refocused its cold gaze on Clyde and Bonnie. Now, human prisoners, resume your full accounting and do not force me to. McCarthy cleared his throat, recapturing the interrogator's attention. Now, now, Inquisitor, let's avoid any undue escalation, shall we? I've found that often, a fresh set of eyes on the facts can reveal insights previously overlooked. The interrogator fell silent, mandibles clicking rapidly, as if agitated but ultimately allowing McCarthy to proceed uninterrupted. The ambassador turned to regard Clyde, hands folded calmly on the table between them. Mr. T Decker, why don't you start from the beginning? filling me in on the details of your shipping operations and livelihood. I'm quite eager to learn more about the unique profile of your vessel as it pertains to this misunderstanding. Clyde couldn't resist a sly grin, sensing the man's subtle invitation to pontificate freely and thoroughly, with no risk of escalating the situation with each embellished ramble. Well now, Ambassador, it would be my genuine pleasure to enlighten your obviously educated mind about the one-of-a-kind marvel that is my beloved Star Runner. He spent the next hour or more recounting a wildly exaggerated and meandering account of the ship's humble origins, 
his emotional attachment to it, and the various modifications that had been enacted through good old-fashioned human elbow grease and know-how over the long decades. McCarthy listened with rapt attentiveness, occasionally jumping in with thoughtful queries or witty rejoinders that only seemed to prolong and enrich Clyde's rambling narrative. For his part, the Zaranif interrogator remained utterly silent and inscrutable, no doubt growing more perplexed and irritated with every outlandish anecdote. But McCarthy was a deft maestro, simply nodding and interjecting enough affirmation to keep Clyde's loquacious banter flowing unbridled. When Clyde at last ran out of fanciful embroidering, McCarthy gave an appreciative nod and smile. My goodness, Mr. Decker, yours is certainly one of the most distinctive entrepreneurial journeys I've had the pleasure of learning about in my travels. He turned to the Zaranith with an amiable expression. Inquisitor, I don't know about you, but I for one find this star runner and its idiosyncrasies utterly fascinating in a purely anthropological sense. The interrogator fixed Clyde with a withering look, though McCarthy affected not to notice. Still, as compelling as the human's testimony has been, I suspect more rigorous examination may be warranted to resolve any lingering ambiguities. Shall we convene for an official inspection of Mr. Decker's ship, Inquisitor? The alien seemed to war with itself for a long moment before inclining its head in terse ascent, mandibles clicking rapidly. With that, McCarthy stood and opened the chamber door, gesturing cordially for Clyde and Bonnie to precede him. Clyde rose unsteadily, feeling a roguish grin split his face as he caught the ambassador's conspiratorial wink. So the game would continue, with a whole new gambit of obfuscation and bureaucratic thwarting aboard his beloved star runner's hallowed bulkheads. He quickly sobered, though as a thought struck him, if McCarthy's diplomatic strong arming failed, just what other trump cards might be required to extricate them from this almighty snarl? For now, he would have to keep the wily human envoy amused and the Zaranif dimwits suitably baffled. But Clyde had the unsettling feeling their clash of cultures and skulduggery was only getting started in earnest. With a tight nod from the Zaranif interrogator, Clyde led the way out of the Stark chamber. Ambassador McCarthy falling in alongside him with the haughty alien glaring daggers at their backs. Bonnie caught up, shooting Clyde a quizzical look that he answered with the faintest of shrugs. Whatever this McCarthy fella had up his diplomatic sleeves, Clyde intended to play along for now and see just how far they could string the aliens out on their own belligerent bureaucracy. The trio made their way in tense silence through the outpost's austere corridors until they reached the central docking bay. There, the battered form of the Star Runner rested in all its ramshackle glory, a defiant middle digit to the sleek, uniform architecture surrounding it. McCarthy paused to regard the freighter, one eyebrow raised appreciatively. Well now, I must say the particulars of your vessels. Distinctive character certainly came through vividly in your accounts, Mr. Decker. He turned with a thin smile. But I am quite eager to see the ragged embrace with my own discerning eyes, as it were. Clyde couldn't resist a tight grin as he punched in his security code, the Star Runner's outer airlock dilating open with a groan of ancient hydraulics. Well then, my esteemed ambassador, prepare to be utterly inspired. The old girl may be suffering a few privations of age, but her spirit is as fiery as ever. With a courtly gesture, he welcomed McCarthy and the stonily imperious interrogator inside. The airlock cycled shut behind them with a dull clank as Clyde led them into the freighter's cramped interior corridors. Immediately it became clear the interrogator was ill at ease among the jury-rigged tangle of pipes, panels, and overflowing containers of haphazard storage that seemed to sprout from every bulkhead and overhead space. The human vessel is disorganized, it stated, eye stalks swiveling rapidly as it tried to maintain a sense of spatial orientation. McCarthy simply chuckled dryly. Oh, come now, Inquisitor. Organized chaos is the very essence of human ingenuity, at least from my experiences. He reached out to trail reverent fingertips along a particularly ad hoc bundle of cables and conduits. Such rapturous, purposeful entropy. It's strangely breathtaking, wouldn't you agree? The alien's only reply was a low, agitated clicking of its mandibles. Clyde took the opportunity to launch into his next round of extemporaneous exaltations and justifications. Ain't a single rivet, relay, or good all piece of spit and bailing wire on my beauty that ain't been lovingly installed by my own calloused mitts over the decades. Why, take this stubborn hunk of drive shielding, for instance. 
he proceeded to regale them with an increasingly farcical anecdote involving the acquisition, installation, and subsequent over-engineered modifications of the rusted machinery, with no detail or digression too minute or outlandish to include. All the while, the interrogator's obsidian eyes seemed to smolder deeper with impotent vexation, while McCarthy actively encouraged the blatant digressions with thoughtful nods and softball queries. Eventually, after leading them on a dizzying, winding path practically to every subordinate tertiary system, Clyde paused outside the threshold of the Star Runner's cramped engine room. And at the metaphorical beating heart of my cantankerous beast, we arrive at the magnificence of her hyperdrive array and antiproton plasma injectors, he declared with a theatrical flourish of his hands. The interrogator immediately moved to gain a better view, eye stalks craning around Clyde, clearly searching for any hint of advanced military technology among the tangled forest of fuel lines and drive components. But McCarthy simply regarded the organized chaos with an inscrutable expression, features utterly impassive save for a slight upturn at the corners of his mouth. Quite the epic journey you've undertaken with this vessel, sir, he said at last, his voice tinged with something like admiration and amusement, simply stupendous. Frustration finally seeming to boil over after Clyde's unending bardic dissembling, the interrogator jabbed an accusing appendage at a blackened tangle of piping running along the far bulkhead. Explain the purpose of those grotesquely oversized thermal suppression units, human. They exceed required specifications for commercial drive cores by several magnitude orders. Clyde blinked, momentarily caught off guard that the alien managed to isolate an actual glaring inconsistency. He rallied quickly, though, with a rakish grin. Ah, eagle eyes you've got there, chum. If you're referring to Big All Bertha and her heat-shunting sisters over yonder, that's just a bit of customized drive venting to handle my truly volcanic propulsion output. He slapped the nearest piping with an echoing clang, writing out the lie with cocksure nonchalance. This radiant beauty may look rough around the burners, but she can outrun and outburn any other junker in the quadrant. Safety first, am I right? Which brings me back to the time on Arkaholt Prime when a dodgy hyperdrive motivator threatened to vent the entire. Enough of your interminable deception, human. The interrogator screeched, cutting Clyde off in a rare show of blatant aggression. Those thermal suppression units are clearly intended to mask residual emissions and energy signatures. A glaring hallmark of stealth armaments in military vessels. It whirled on McCarthy, carapace bristling with indignation. This fool has deluded you with his nonsensical jabbering long enough, Ambassador. I will have his vessel fully impounded and every component taken apart to root out his treacherous weapons tech. For once, McCarthy's unflappable countenance seemed to slip ever so slightly as unease flickered across his chiseled features. Clyde went rigid, mind already racing through potential next moves. Had they finally pushed the xenomorph hardline too far? Just when it seemed tensions would boil over into an uglier confrontation, Bonnie's voice suddenly cut through from the corridor behind them. Now y'all just hold your horses and piss funnels for a gosh darned minute. All eyes turned toward the newcomer in the entryway, a rough hewn human male, dressed in nondescript ship coveralls streaked with decades of engine grease and burn marks. The grizzled older man jabbed a thumb over his shoulder with a lopsided grin. Sorry I was late to the shindig matches. Had some urgent business to attend to in the latrines after last night's good times with the hooch still. I'm Maynard, Clyde's chief engineering Malacca, and I reckon I can clear this whole star-blistered misunderstanding right up for you uglies. Clyde blinked in surprise at the grizzled newcomer, his mind struggling to process this unexpected new player in their increasingly convoluted galactic game of cat and mouse. He shot Bonnie a questioning look, but she simply shrugged, the ghost of a smirk playing across her lips. Metchus, you'll have to forgive all Maynard here, the supposed engineer drawled, sauntering up to clap Clyde heartily on the shoulder. Man's as slavishly devoted to our trusty tub of bolts as a vegan separatist at a chilly cook-off. McCarthy arched an eyebrow, seeming to cottoning on to some unspoken undercurrent in the bizarre encounter. I see. Well then, Mr. Maynard, was it? Perhaps you could indeed shed some much-needed light on the quandary at hand. The interrogator, however, remained rigid and unconvinced, beady eyes narrowing to obsidian slits. This is highly irregular, it stated flatly. You were not included in the initial detainment and questioning procedures. Explain your belated presence immediately. 
Maynard shrugged his grease-stained shoulders, either unconcerned or oblivious to the alien's confrontational tone. Like I said, ugly I was handling ship's business, as is my humble role and charge on this here rig. Sorry if the calm got crossed about my coming to lend a hand in clearing the bureaucratic lube traps for the captain and missus. He turned and began a leisurely circuit of the cramped engine room, humming to himself as he reached out to caress various pipes and terminals like a blind man mapping its contours. All the while, the interrogator tracked his eccentric movements with undisguised suspicion and mounting frustration. Just when it looked like the alien would lose its veneer of composure, Maynard paused beside the very component that had drawn such intense scrutiny earlier, the oversized heat shunts and baffling auxiliary piping. Now as I figure it, ye scaly buggers got your undergarments certifiably twisted about the purpose of our precious Bertha and her extended ventral family here. His grin broadened as he winked conspiratorially at Clyde and McCarthy. Well, glory, hallelujah. You're right to be confounded and all cause the truth is. This whole shebang is nothing but the result of some old-fashioned human stubbornness and over-engineering. Clyde felt his jaw drop as the fictional Maynard launched into an intricate, pitch-perfect fabrication about the origins and rationale behind the drive system's glaring aberrations. He spun a fanciful yarn of interwoven anecdotes and technical justifications that left even the composed McCarthy looking dazed, all delivered in a naturalistic torrent of folksy metaphors and turns of phrase. All the while, the interrogator seemed to swell with frustration and uncertainty, mandibles clicking rapidly as it struggled to keep pace with the organic chaos unfolding before it. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Maynard's breathless reminiscences finally wound down, punctuated by an expectant look toward the bristling xenoform. The engine room fell into a thick, soupy silence that seemed to stretch for an eon. Then, with surprising restraint, the interrogator raised a single thin appendage. Your clarifications regarding the vessel's highly unorthodox drive management systems and thermal regulation have been recorded human. It swiveled to face McCarthy, feigning an air of detached professionalism despite the tension courting its armored carapace. Ambassador, I must confer and correlate this new information with existing collective data before any determinations of status or legality can be made. McCarthy nodded placidly, the perfect image of open-minded diplomacy. But of course, Inquisitor, I would expect nothing less than a thorough cross-examination from someone of your elevated investigative standards. The interrogator clicked its mandibles in a terse, agitated manner, but otherwise held its peace. With a final narrow look at the four humans, it pivoted on its spindly legs and stalked from the chamber without another word. As soon as the hiss of the decompressing airlock faded, the imposter Maynard turned to Clyde and Bonnie with a crooked grin. Well, that seemed to rattle the all-bugs thorax a fair bit, eh, Captain? Before Clyde could open his mouth to respond, Ambassador McCarthy stepped forward, expression mild but eyes twinkling with mirth. I must say... That was an absolute tour de force in extemporaneous obfuscation and techno-babble, my good man. I haven't been simultaneously so utterly baffled and yet utterly entertained by mendacious Buncombe in quite some time. He extended a hand, which the faux engineer clasped firmly. Ambassador David McCarthy leads in relations at a shea for this sector. And you would be? Their grizzled visitor tipped him a rakish wink before responding. Morgan Aubrey, Mr. Ambassador. Bullshit artist extraordinaire at your stellar service. Clyde felt his eyebrows shoot up as the charismatic stranger Morgan Aubrey revealed his true colors with that sly wink and sardonic introduction. He opened his mouth, a dozen questions on the tip of his tongue, but Aubrey pre-empted him with a casual wave of his hand. I know, I know you're simply awash in bewilderment over my inexplicable arrival and role in this little interstellar contretemps, the grizzled man said an easy grin playing across his weathered features. But trust me, Captain, when this star-blistered dust-up first started gaining traction, a couple buddies of mine caught the astral winds of what was brewing. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder in the vague direction. The Zaranif interrogator had departed. Let's just say certain diplomatic elements figured having an outlier like me join the party could grease some seized-up lube fittings in the conversation, if you take my meaning. Aubrey's eyes crinkled with wry amusement as Clyde felt the first inklings of dawning comprehension. This rogue had been some kind of ringer, inserted into the powder keg by allied human parties with the knowledge that sometimes the only way to parley with stubborn aliens was to overwhelm them with weaponized nonsense. You're, you're some kind of secret weapon? 
Bonnie spoke up, sounding equal parts incredulous and begrudgingly impressed. Like a bullshit core that just vomits up enough meaningless static to short-circuit alien bureaucracy? Well now, Mrs. Decker, I do love your rapturous way with metaphor, Aubrey replied with an appreciative chuckle. Let's just say I and a few similar. Liberated thinkers make ourselves available to help nudge particularly obdurate inhuman stalemates in a more pragmatic direction when the occasion calls for it. Unorthodox accommodation through creative linguistics and subterfuge, McCarthy murmured, an inscrutable look on his face as he studied the mysterious man. You are certainly a compelling case study in human cultural idiosyncrasies, Mr. Kazara Aubrey. The grizzled stranger's grin widened as he caught McCarthy's oblique meaning and veiled compliment. Why, thank you kindly, Ambassador, though I must admit it was merely your own virtuosic performance that set the stage for my humbler efforts. He tipped an imaginary hat toward Clyde and Bonnie, and the Decker's full-hearted embracing of the improvisational spirit that really kick-started the fertile musical fugue, if you'll excuse my artful phrasing. Bonnie rolled her eyes, though the corners of her mouth twitched with reluctant humor. Clyde himself couldn't quite suppress a snort of laughter at Aubrey's unabashed almost physical embodiment of blue-collar Blarney. Well, I don't rightly know how we got roped into such a elevated plane of galactic gamesmanship and deception, he began, shaking his head ruefully. But I sure as hell hope we're headed somewhere good for all the headaches we've endured so far. Aubrey's expression turned momentarily serious, a razor-sharp intelligence glinting behind his twinkling eyes. Rest assured, Captain, this entire affair has been artfully choreographed by some admittedly eccentric but highly placed human elements. The ultimate objective is to shed stark light on the systemic flaws and dogma obstructing the Zaranith Collective's ability to apply reason to their own arcane bureaucracy. The rogue pursed his lips in a thin smile. They call it constructive cultural subversion, using our species' unique penchant for obfuscation and absurdist rationale to sow seeds of progressive reform within even the most ossified alien institutions. McCarthy gave a tight nod, features inscrutable. An admittedly unorthodox methodology, he allowed evenly. But I've found that sometimes. Human unorthodoxy can be the most effective instrument of diplomacy when circumstances require. A heavy silence fell over the trio as the weight of Aubrey's revelations hung in the recycled air. After a long moment, the grizzled rogue cleared his throat, the roguish spark returning to his eyes. Well now, no sense getting too heavy and cosmic about the grand celestial chessboard at play here. I believe the next move in our particular gambit involves me regaling that hidebound alien hard case with an even more stupendously mangled account of human starship operations, am I right? He rubbed his calloused hands together in evident relish. Might want to break out your best astrum deforical embroidery props, folks. I've got a real doozy of a narrative teed up that'll have our green-jawed friend spitting out its own abdomen by the midpoint crescendo. As Aubrey launched into increasingly outrageous outlining of his planned farcical saga, Clyde shook his head in wonderment. Just when he thought he had a grip on the intricacies and high stakes of their fateful cultural collision with the Zaranith, the entire situation had catapulted into a whole new audacious plane of absurdist maneuvering. All he could do was buckle in and brace for the turbulence because something told him this Morgan Aubrey character was just getting warmed up on his one-man quest to reduce their captors to gibbering, disillusioned husks through the sheer psychic hammerblow of human ridiculousness. Clyde wasn't sure how long Aubrey's latest bardic fugue of obfuscation and absurdist ship tech anecdotes ultimately lasted. Time itself seemed to distort and bend under the relentless psychic assault of the man's naturalistic technobabble framed in increasingly outlandish metaphors and florid turns of phrase. By the time the rogue finally wound down, sweat beating on his grizzled brow, the Zaranith interrogator sat utterly motionless across the table, eyes unfocused and mandibles hanging slackly from its armored carapace. Clyde caught Bonnie pressing her knuckles against her lips, her shoulders shaking with barely suppressed mirth, while McCarthy simply watched the proceedings with an impassive expression bordering on rapturous disbelief. Aubrey let out a gusty sigh and leaned back evidently reveling in the stunned silence that greeted the culmination of his performative maelstrom. After several pregnant moments, the interrogator seemed to reanimate enough to swivel its obsidian gaze toward McCarthy, feebly gesticulating with one spindly appendage. This narrative, it is not possible. No known physical laws or technological principles could account for even a fraction of the human's assertions. 
Aubrey tissed loudly, shaking his head in an exaggerated display of disappointment. Well now, no need to get all galactically cynical and close-minded on us, bug buddy. I thought the spatial tensor calibrations and protomatter flux differentials were rather elegant solutions to the hyperliminal chafer quandary. There is no such phenomenon. The interrogator snapped, a tremor entering its reedy voice. You have woven an intricate web of meaningless jargon and outright fabrications that defies all logic or reason. Easy there, friend, easy, Aubrey soothed with an unctuous grin, raising his hands placatingly. No need for any undue elevation of thorax smart ports over any of this, all right? I understand the idiosyncratic brain wiring of my species can be a challenging altazimuth for your kind to conceptually haul and navigate at times. Clyde found himself biting the inside of his cheek, absolutely gobsmacked by the bottomless well of invented gibberish flowing effortlessly from Aubrey's deceptively folksy demeanor. Even McCarthy looked momentarily polaxed behind his mask of professional decorum. The interrogator, meanwhile, seemed to twitch and shudder with every folksy metaphysical absurdity Aubrey effortlessly spouted. Finally, it let out a piercing, inhuman screech, appendages flailing in apparent outrage and frustration. Enough of this pointless prattle. This entire proceeding has devolved into an asinine spectacle of crass deception and disrespect for interstellar protocol. It rounded on McCarthy, compound eyes bulging furiously. Ambassador, you have permitted your own kind to obstruct justice through increasingly preposterous tactics. If such willful abuse of the diplomatic process continues, I will be forced to make a formal reprisal request to the adjudicator overseeing this station. McCarthy's features remained carefully neutral, though Clyde could have sworn he detected the faintest downturn at the corners of the man's mouth. Clearly, the situation was threatening to spiral out of even his skillful control. Still, when he spoke, the ambassador's voice was measured and eminently reasonable. Now, now, Inquisitor, let's not get too overzealous and jump to unnecessary escalations, hin. Despite some admittedly unorthodox conversational deviations, I believe significant progress has been made in reaching a nuanced understanding of the highly specialized nature of the human's activities. The interrogator opened its mouth, no doubt to unleash a furious rebuttal, but McCarthy smoothly pressed on. In fact, I would propose an extended recess from these proceedings, giving both sides ample time to reflect objectively on the many revelations and insights gained thus far. He fixed the seething alien with a frank look, his own expression betraying not a hint of guile. Diplomacy is an arena that rewards patience as much as vigor, Inquisitor. A brief pause to realign perspectives may well reveal a clear path forward that has so far eluded us, yes. For a long, tense moment, Clyde was certain the overbearing alien would simply override McCarthy's politic overtures and unilaterally enact some draconian punitive measure right then and there. He felt his muscles tense instinctively, prepping for potential combat regs and protocols be damned if it came to securing his freedom and property by force. But then, as quickly as it had swelled to apoplectic fury, the interrogator seemed to wilt slightly, its bristling carapace settling as it wrestled its simmering wrath back under a visage of fragile control. Finally, it gave a terse nod of assent to McCarthy's proposal. A temporary abeyance will be reluctantly granted, it conceded, fixing each of the humans with a cold, unwavering glare. But make no mistake any further outrageous deviations or affronts to due process will prompt irreversible escalations without exception. With that ominous proclamation still hanging in the air, the haughty alien turned on a spindly heel and stalked out of the chamber without another word, its armored footfalls echoing hollowly in the tense silence. For several long moments, nobody spoke or moved, as if still frozen by the interrogator's scarcely veiled threats. Then Aubrey let out a noisy exhalation, slapping his palms on his thighs with a rueful grin. Well, hot damn, looks like we jumped the star shark on that one, eh, boys? I think my allegorical wellspring was running just a scosh too rich for our esteemed friend's fuel scrubbers to keep up with. McCarthy allowed himself a tight smile, shaking his head slowly in apparent wonderment at the roguish man's irrepressible nature. Bonnie openly scoffed, muttering something about jackasses and horse manure. But Clyde simply raked his fingers through his hair, suddenly feeling bone-deep weariness from the harrowing ordeal settle in his very marrow. 
As much outrageous headway as they'd made towards undermining the alien agenda, it was swiftly becoming apparent they were skating along the very brink of disaster with every sly gambit and bit of bureaucratic subterfuge. With a grinding sense of trepidation, he wondered just how much further they could push their outrageous con before the whole intergalactic charade finally shattered around them in brutal, unforgiving reality. The tense atmosphere lingered long after the bristling interrogator's exit. Clyde found himself pacing the confines of the Star Runner's cramped engine room, fingers kneading at the taut muscles along the back of his neck. Bonnie hovered nearby, arms crossed and expression carefully neutral, though he could practically taste the roiling vortex of her unvoiced thoughts and frustrations. McCarthy and Aubrey, for their part, had withdrawn into a quiet discussion in one corner, the ambassador's body language lending an aura of urgency to their murmured exchange. Clyde couldn't make out their hushed words, but he had the distinct sense that recent events had lent a more sober undercurrent to the proceedings a realization that for all their absurdist maneuverings, they were playing a dangerous game of cultural chicken against implacable alien resolve. Finally, the two men seemed to reach some kind of accord. McCarthy straightened and cleared his throat, the subtle furrows of strain etched in his craggy features. I believe a brief interlude is indeed wise at this juncture given the escalating tensions of our impasse. With the Inquisitor's reluctant approval, you and your crew will be permitted to return to your personal quarters within the recreational hub, while both sides reconvene. Aubrey shot Clyde a roguish wink, his own face carefully composed into an expression of benign diplomacy that nonetheless somehow seemed to convey the sense of a coiled spring, ready to detonate into even more farcical theatrics at a moment's provocation. For his part, Clyde simply felt a bone-deep weariness settle upon his shoulders, momentarily robbing him of his customary swagger and glib defiance. He found himself grateful for the reprieve, no matter how temporary eager for even the most fleeting chance to gather his wits and center himself in the eye of this increasingly turbulent hurricane of bureaucracy and obfuscation. With a dull nod of acquiescence, he jerked his head towards the hatchway, silently signaling Bonnie to follow. His wife quirked a sardonic eyebrow, but fell dutifully in step as they made their way out of the Star Runner's controlled chaos and into the stark, recycled air of the outpost's corridors. The trip through the chill, oppressive architecture passed in silence, both of them lost in their own churning inner reflections. Only once they had been processed through another interminable security checkpoint and ushered into the moderately comfortable, but distinctly bare-walled quarter module did Bonnie finally break the quiet pall between them. So. I gotta admit, I did not see that one common when those uglies first nabbed us for processing or whatever, she groused, shrugging off her jacket as she plopped heavily onto the room's solitary couch. Secret human anti-bureaucratic chaos agents, intergalactic mind gamers. I feel like we wandered ass backwards into an alternate dimension somewhere along the way. Clyde allowed himself a tired chuckle as he dropped into the adjacent armchair, kneading at the ache blooming along his temples. You're telling me, darling. I went into this S.H. Vinick just aiming to talk my way out of a parking ticket at worst. Next thing I know, we're the Don Quixote windmills for some high-level prank war against an entire alien civilization's obsessive love of red tape. A sly grin broke across Bonnie's face as she cocked her head appraisingly. Still gotta admit, I am quite impressed with your ability to spitshine the old Blarney burner nozzle and fling nonsense with the best of M when the time came. Her expression softened slightly as she leaned forward, resting her elbows on her knees. I never did doubt you'd outfox those runny nostril warts eventually, love. Just let's try and avoid getting outfoxed ourselves by whatever deeper games those diplomatic gonks have us tangled up in, eh? Clyde felt his shoulders sag a little further as he regarded his wife his literal and metaphorical co-pilot through all the triumphs and tribulations of their hardscrabble life amid the stars. A pang of guilt pricked at him, not for the first time, over all the trials and impossible circumstances his stubborn dreams of roaming independence had dragged her through over the decades. But Bonnie's expression told him all he needed to know that she understood the risks and stakes, but nonetheless drew the same rapturous thrills and galactic romance from their crazy, perilous existence that he did. Still, Clyde couldn't resist the impulse to reach out and grasp her weathered, calloused hand in his own, trapping it in an anchoring squeeze. I hear you loud and clear, beautiful. But you know your Clyde never could pass up the chance to run a con and pull off a real soaring gambit, even on an intergalactic scale like this one. He allowed his features to crease into that crooked grin she adored despite herself. 
way eyes figure it, those scaly jarheads have tantalized us with a glimpse of just how stick-spined and ripe for unraveling their whole pompous system truly is thanks to their chronic lack of whimsy and flair for life's absurdities. Clyde leaned forward until their foreheads were practically touching, his gaze burning with renewed fire and determination. So I say we saddle up and ride this bronco all the way to the cosmic campfire, love. Show those naked ape haters just how freeing and joyfully deranged the human spirit can truly be when the stakes are ramped up to gibbering maximum. Bonnie regarded Clyde for a long moment, her eyes inscrutable. Then, almost imperceptibly, the hint of a smile tugged at the corner of her mouth as she gave a slow nod. You keep that crazy spark burning bright inside you, flyboy. It's what's always gotten us through every celestial shitshow the universe chucks our way. She leaned back with a theatrical groan, stretching her arms over her head until her spine gave a series of satisfying pops and cracks. All right then, seeing as it's going to be a scorcher of a star blazing encore performance ahead, I'd best get a power recharge and freshen up before we go break some more alien minds. Clyde watched with naked appreciation as his wife rose fluidly to her feet, already shucking her sweat-stained shirt over her head as she sauntered towards the tiny refresher cubicle. Just before disappearing from view, she paused to toss him a saucy wink over her shoulder. Don't go galaxy-brained on any new bullshit salvos without me, Captain. I aim to be your co-pilot on all fronts till the last hyperdrive burns out. With that, the hatch slid shut behind her, leaving Clyde alone with his churning thoughts amidst the stark, sterile accommodations. He let out a slow, grounding breath, feeling the coiled nexus of tension and anxiety within him gradually loosen and unwind. Bonnie was right, they'd weathered bigger storms together, hurtled higher, seemingly impossible odds through sheer force of human ingenuity and stubbornness. Hell, he should be downright stir-crazy with anticipation over the auspices ahead, not weighed down by trepidation. With a grunt, Clyde heaved himself out of the chair and began pacing the confines of their temporary sanctuary. His mind raced over the recent whiplash-inducing reversals, trying to piece together the bigger mosaic that had landed them in such a ludicrous galactic farce. He kept circling back to Aubrey, the wild card whose very presence signaled the existence of much deeper currents and agendas in play. Strange as it seemed, the grizzled rogue had insisted they were mere convenient chess pieces in some grand human stratagem unwitting saboteurs injected into the hidebound bureaucracy of the Zaranith Collective in the hopes of sowing enough delirium and heretical notions to kickstart reform from the inside out. Clyde had his doubts that the gulf between human mercurial expressiveness and the Zaranith's obsessive dogma was bridgeable by any amount of absurdist cultural disruption. Still, he couldn't deny that in the interrogator's scandalized, disbelieving reactions to their every farcical escalation, he'd glimpsed the first faint cracks beginning to riddle the facade of alien certainty and superiority. Perhaps that was the entire point. He mused to gradually batter and erode their captors' beliefs through conceited condescension and open defiance until enough existential seed shavings of doubt sprouted free-thinking roots. If nothing else, They'd given the Zaranith their first grudging taste of human improvisational unpredictability. A subtle creak from the refresher cubicle announced Bonnie's return, clad in a fresh suit of lightweight ship clothes. She cocked her head quizzically as she noted Clyde's pensive demeanor. Engines cycling a little too rich there, Captain. What conquest of chaos has the gears stripping out this time? Clyde allowed himself a roguish grin as he turned to regard his wife. Drinking in the feral spark and leonine prowess, she exuded even in moments of relative respite. Just churning up some grease-brained gambits for our grand encore performance, my celestial bloom, he said easily. I figure since sick boy and the diplomatic flyweights seem hell-bent on us showing the scrapes, the full randy revelry of our god's laughing chaos, we best inject a lil' WD-40 ingenuity into the final showstopper. Bonnie's own smile broadened into a matching expression of unholy delight. She prowled closer until they were practically pressed together, hands roaming freely. Uo, now that's what I like to hear my daring desperado already scheming up new permutations on our cheerfully depraved absurdities. Her eyes sparkled with mischief. So what fresh celestial bullgazery does the galaxy's most shameless freighter jockey have in mind for blowing the Xenoid gaskets clean off? Emboldened by the thrill of Sweet Bonnie's impish, conspiratorial energy, Clyde felt his own imagination kick into high hyperdrive. 
A dozen deliciously ludicrous ideas began coalescing and mutating in his whirling mind unorthodox proposals and improvisations he could layer atop Aubrey's own chaotic fugues, piling increasingly farcical obfuscations upon each other like some demented game of psychic Jenga. Giving his wife's ample backside an appreciative squeeze, he pulled her into a deep, ravenous kiss, already feeling the embers of manic determination rekindle into a blazing inferno of purpose. Just you wait and witness my mercurial starfire, he purred against her eager lips. This encore is going to be one for the Astro Vids, the kind of riotous, boundary fracturing mind squall that'll have those withered alien minds begging to rupture their own brain pans before the first crescendo. Bonnie let out a gleeful whoop, twining herself tighter against him. Ooh, is it twisted and wrong that just hearing you spout such filthy, depraved notions gets me all fizzy and carbonated, lover? Clyde chuckled deeply, hands already busying themselves re-establishing their intimate stellar trajectories amid their passionate, molecular drift. Wouldn't have you any other way, darlin', he growled. Now come ease the kraken of your captain's madness before we burst the space-time continuum with pure, righteous human impropriety. As their ravenous embrace descended into blissful, free-spirited chaos, Clyde allowed the tangled schemes and improvisational eventualities to take riotous wing within the constellation of his churning, mercurial consciousness. By the time the Zaranith Inquisitor's next summoning came, every human and inhuman kraken hungering to be unleashed upon that stuffy outpost's halls would be primed and ready to cleanse the cold equations of imperial dogma with the wildfire of life's cheerful, anarchic absurdities. For Clyde Decker long ago embraced his birthright as a fevered agent of celestial pandemonium. And this time, the chaos would give glorious, feral rebirth to entire worlds of hide-bound certainties.